Hi everybody, Michael Davis here and welcome to Bone to Pick. We are coming to you today from Carroll Studios on West 55th Street here in New York City. And we are uh, indeed very fortunate to have an opportunity to sit down with our Artist of the Month for April, the great David Krause. David has been the principal trumpet of the Metropolitan Opera Orchestra since 2001. Uh, very in demand and very busy on the New York classical freelance scene as well as recording scene and uh, the occasional Broadway show over the years. Uh, he has a bachelor's and master's degree from the Juilliard School. Uh, his teachers have included William Vacchiano, uh, James Pandolfi, Chris Gecker, and Wynton Marsalis. Uh, he's currently on the faculty at the Manhattan School of Music, the Manus School of Music, and Rutgers University in New Jersey. Um, I'm honored to uh, call David a friend of mine. Uh, I've had the great fortune to work with him many times in the studios, and uh, I can tell you it's, it's always a pleasure to uh, see him, and it's especially a pleasure to get to hear him and, uh, and uh, get an opportunity to play with him. So, David, thanks so much for taking time out of your insanely busy schedule. We've been working on this for a few months, so we got, finally got him today. So thank you for coming down. As, uh, I feel like after that introduction, we should stop there. <laughs> like before I louse things up. <laughs> Not at all. And uh, as you will all see, uh, you, you see uh, one of the nicest and humblest people you'll ever meet. So that's a great lesson for all of us as well. Um, you know what, let's just start from the very beginning. Talk about growing up. I know you grew up in Long Island, so obviously close to here. Um, and you know, what are some of your early influences and maybe what steered you towards the trumpet at, at an early age? Well, uh, growing up in Long Island, uh, originally I was born in Stony Brook, which is pretty far out. Um, but then we moved closer in, exactly 15 miles from the, the Queens Midtown Tunnel. So when you when you grow up that close to a uh, Manhattan, you're. I remember just, I want to be a Manhattan. End of story. Mm -hmm. That's it. My my dream was to someday live in a, in a doorman building. You know, uh, that was like, uh, that was it. I guess my earliest influence, trumpet wise. Um, was I was fortunate enough <clears throat> in my elementary school to have a, a, a jazz program in the whole district. So mm. elementary, uh, middle school, and high school had full. So fourth grade, they were like, what do you want to play? And somehow I landed up with a trumpet. So I was really fortunate to have had great band directors uh, and uh, uh, th throughout from fourth grade on. Mm. I mean, really, really fortunate. And and. I think actually things have changed in the school a little bit now, and 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 it's it's kind of sad that those things aren't a given across mm -hmm. the country. But it was when I was in school, uh, so I was really lucky with that. Um, and then uh, when I remember specifically uh, when I was 13 for my bar mitzvah, I got a turntable from my dad, who my dad uh, is a big audiophile, and I got an LP uh, of uh, of Winton. Oh, wow. Uh, so, cool. So uh, this would have been like 84, uh, and Winton would, had just come out with um, his Haydn Hummel mm -hmm. um, and uh, his, his the Hot House Flowers was right around there with strings, and, uh, and he had a self title, it was just called Winton. So I remember listening, wearing down those grooves. Uh, <laughs> and uh, transcribing the solos and just trying to, the ones that I could play, the slow ones, uh, and just trying to sound desperately like Winton, uh, which is a ridiculous thing to try <laughs> because, you know, nobody can sound like him. But that was, uh, that was like the mainstay <clears throat> of my musical influence, just listening to those records. Wow. Um, well, talk about a great uh, person to uh, emulate. You yeah. Know? I mean, it doesn't get much better than that. So Right. Yeah. The, Good fortune to, to go in the right direction early on. Yeah, and and and, and fortunately, my well, again, my dad especially was a big jazz uh, fan, and not a musician, but uh, neither of my parents musicians they both played piano. But um, they would, my parents would take me in at a very young age to the Blue Note when uh, so they saw how much I liked Winton, and so, so whenever Winton was playing, and back then his his group used to play. But now they're touring. They just got mm -hmm. back from Europe. They're, they're all over the place. But they used to play at the Blue Note pretty regularly in mm -hmm. other clubs. Um, but I remember going in at age 13 to the Blue Note for the first time and sitting right dead center, right 
up and uh, this was, uh, I remember hearing Wycliffe Gordon play in the in the in the quintet was it a quintet I guess it was a quintet uh, and his slide like would drip like right over my <laughs> seven up or whatever I was drinking <clears throat> um, so that was uh, that was an amazing uh, experience but first of all being there with my folks and then but being there uh, so close to him and then my mom urging me uh, against my will to go talk to him because I was just so embarrassed <laughs> uh, and finally uh, so at, after enough times he, he remembered me uh, and he said well why don't you come to my apartment and play for me and I just I think my body just literally died for like a good couple minutes I was just so taken back and so that started and we're uh, we're still pretty uh, I still consider him a teacher uh, but yeah we'll text uh, he just texted me a couple days ago see how the family is but uh, it's that that's probably my biggest and earliest musical influence mm, awesome yeah that's fantastic well I mentioned in the intro that you uh, you did your uh, college uh, years at Juilliard obviously one of the preeminent schools anywhere in the world. Um, you can talk a little bit about your time there, and I guess I'm assuming you were a classical major. I think back then they probably didn't have they a jazz it, uh, yeah. major. But uh, what was that like, uh, and and what were your your experiences there in terms of uh, teachers? Uh, well, I started actually in pre-college, mm -hmm. so uh, I started uh, uh, my junior year when I got pretty serious about um, about trumpet. I was already coming in. To the city for lessons um, all the time, and I remember at my pre-college audition. Uh, my mom was so. It is like a therapy session now. We're talking about more <laughs> about my mom than anything else. Uh, my mom was so enamored about being in this f famous building that she. Uh, there was a stand outside of the fifth floor, and it's just, you know spray painted Juilliard. Just all the stands had like Juilliard on it. And she was, I'm like, Mom, what are you doing? She goes, I'm, shut up, I'm trying to steal this stand and bring it home. <laughs> Assuming that I wouldn't get into pre-college and like, we'll never be allowed in the building again. She's like, you're gonna want this for later. I was like, all right. <laughs> I don't think she stole it, because uh, only probably because it was immovable. Um, but uh, that's my earliest Juilliard recollection. <clears throat> but I ended up doing uh, two years of pre-college there. And then it just seemed, you know, in retrospect, and now I, I have so many students that uh, this time of year they're now just finding out about their college auditions mm -hmm. and having my own kids, uh, one of which is at Juilliard now and uh, had auditioned a lot of places. I know I was pretty green in terms of the audition process because I was at Juilliard. I'd go there every Saturday. I'd be like, huh, I'd like, I'd like to go here. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I just auditioned uh, and got in. And then when I was uh, when I was in my my senior year, I said, "Oh, masters, you know, oh, I'd like to do a masters here." And it wasn't until uh, I remember this at the audition on the fifth floor. Uh, I think it was at five nineteen. I remember thinking right as I sat down, I was about to play the uh, the Hindemith Sonata and a bunch of excerpts, thinking. I should have applied other places because it's highly <laughs> likely that I'm going to completely crap all over this and not get in, and then I have nothing to do. Um, and I was fortunate enough to uh, to get in uh, again. I did it, so I didn't really th have much thought process, uh, um, just because it was so comfortable yeah. of a place for me. Um, and uh, at the time, there were so many people on the trumpet faculty. Uh, uh, there was, uh, well, a guy named Ed Troidel, who, right, uh, right. who who passed away some time ago, and, and Vacchiano was there as, you know, kind of the two elder statesmen, and there, and there was um, uh, Ray Mace and Mark and, and Mel Broyles um, and Chris Gecker, uh, and then Phil Smith, too, for a while. Um, so there was, there was a lot of people. So it was like, yeah, yeah. It was, it was, it was such. So if I had, you know, if I had an audition coming up, I'd, I'd go play for Phil, uh, just, just because I had access to him somehow, or at least I thought I did, uh, just because you know he was on faculty there. Back then, you had to call people instead of like text them. <laughs> and I remember once he, uh, he, he was always so nice. 
and he says, yeah, you, you know, call me when you want for a lesson. I remember I was getting ready for some summer audition and I was so, you know, now you just send a text and whatever. Like mm -hmm. I get, hey, Mr. Krause, can I have a lesson? Whatever. Uh, it's easy to, to respond, but back then having to call their home number. Right, right. It's like dialing 201, <laughs> like my hand would shake for Phil. And uh, so like, hello, Mr. Smith, you know, can, can, is it possible? Can I have a lesson? Uh, and he goes, yeah, sure. He says, would you mind calling me um, after the Super Bowl? Like I didn't, I had, I had called him during the Super Bowl. <laughs> I was like completely, I had, uh, uh, yeah. Um, That's so, really good. Uh, but uh, but there were a lot of people to take lessons with, and it was uh, a really great scene for me. The only drag was uh, there were so many great players, and I was uh, a late bloomer. Hmm. Uh, and and that's not me being humble. That's me be stating the facts. Like there, I was just I was getting second on all the concertos, uh, not trumpet concertos, like the piano concertos and stuff. Uh, and I didn't really get like good assignments or, or audition well until late in my undergraduate and mm -hmm. then into my master's. I just, I, I, uh, for one reason or another, uh, but it was, it, so it was hard. It was hard. Uh, there's so many great players, Sure. so many sure. great players. Um, but you know, it, it inspires you if you, if you can, if you could deal with it, it's, it's competition is a good thing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, you, you certainly figured out the audition thing. I mean, the, uh, well, how to, how to uh, rise above it. That's uh, but, one you, of the you only things. have to do it once, really. <laughs> that is, you're absolutely right. That is the great thing about going to a, a school like Juilliard. You're just going to be, as long as you can deal with it, you're going to be inspired by all the great players around you. Uh, almost, I always found it almost as much as, as the, the, the teachers in a, in a certain kind of way. You know? Right. Like it's, now you know, it's inspiring. Then it was, it was just like really depressing. <laughs> like, I'm not being funny. Like you'd walk on the third floor of Juilliard and you hear uh, Jens Lindemann. Do you know Jens? Yeah, sure, sure. You'd hear him practicing. It's like, seriously? Yeah. Like, uh, he's literally practicing double tonguing octaves, like fast, like playing, do I get do I get do it? Like, this, the ga is the second octave. And then three octaves and all this stuff. And guys like Mark Niehaus, uh, Rich Kelly. Uh, it's too many players even, even to go into. Kevin Cobb, uh, right. Mark yeah. Inouye's uh, w with me. I mean, so many, so mm -hmm. many guys. Mm -hmm. I'm leaving probably, you know, 18 amazing players <laughs> out. Uh, but, uh, and now it's, uh, it's inspiring. Uh, and, I, and I can remember bits of that, but like at the time, it's like cutthroat, just mm. depressing. Mm -hmm. At least it was for me. <laughs> uh, let me ask you, uh, you, you know, I, I mentioned your four, I mean, I'm sure, you, like you said, you took uh, lessons from uh, a variety of folks, but um, it seemed like your four primary tr teachers were um, Vacchiano, uh, James Gia, um Pandolfi. Pandolfi, sorry, um, Chris Gecker, and when. Um, I was just going to ask you, as I mentioned, each one of those four names, give me just like a couple of things that, that you took away, like, I mean, I'm sure you took a lot away from each one of them, but yeah. but what would be the, the main core of, of what you got from each one of those four gentlemen, all four incredible teachers in their own right? Yeah. Um, it's, it's hard to distill it. Um, Facciano was just, uh, it, it was, I, I feel so lucky to have been around mm -hmm. uh, uh, because he, he was pretty old. Mm. When I was studying mm -hmm. with him, uh, and I was I was turned to Vacchiano from Jim Pandolfi, who mm -hmm. was a, who, who studied with Vacchiano. And Jim, for those who don't know, uh, was third trumpet player at the Met. Um, amazing, amazing trumpet player, um, and he's since um, retired. Um, but Jim said, "You got to go study with Vacchiano. Like it's ridiculous that you're not studying with him." And I was studying with a guy named. Ed Troidel at the time, so I went to study with Vacchiano, and uh, I went in the lesson, and uh, he said, or Jim said, tell Vacchiano, I said, hi. I sit down my first lesson, and, uh, and I said, Mr. Vacchiano, Jim Pandolfi told me I should be studying with you, so I'm really happy that you took me on. And he said, ah, oh, Pandolfi, he said, I used to call him Meatball. <laughs> he says, but, uh, but you, Kraus, you I'm going to call him matzo ball. <laughs> and I was like, all right. Uh, so, and he was such a sweet guy. Um, 
and uh, I'm going to talk for like hours about him. I won't. Um, Vacchiano uh, taught me a lot of things, but the, the one thing that comes back all the time in my teaching, in my own playing, and at my job is like, everybody talks about, you know, if you're a Vacchiano student, it's transposition of mouthpieces. Like he did a fair, we did transposition all the time. That was incredibly helpful. Mm -hmm. uh, but the thing that I really got from him was uh, his insistence on basic musical manners, simple things like uh, he'd always yell, feminine endings. Can, can you mm. even say feminine hmm. endings anymore? I don't mm. know. Uh, but, you know, coming, coming away, knowing which notes to go to and which notes to come away from, really basic phrasing stuff, like hmm. the most essential bit, like nothing overly complicated. But he'd stop me, you know, whether we're doing Mahler 5 or some etude or even a scale, uh, really basic ways to play in 4-4 four, four, and 3-4, basic ways to play a dotted A 16th, differences between, you know, what you have to do, uh, you know, if you play, if you have uh, a, a duple here and a triple here, you know, you have to do something in a duple so they sound different. And all these things that I kind of filed away was not helpful at all at the time mm -hmm. because all I wanted to learn was how to play high and loud. <laughs> but fortunately, it stuck uh, because now it's, it's like the difference between a musician and a moron a lot of times. Mm. It's, and some great players, sometimes you, I hear these students that can play, you know, t 10 times better than me, but then they're doing this bonehead stuff musically that only seems really boneheaded to me because it was drilled into me hmm. at, a, at an impressionable age, I think. So that, that was, you know, I, I think that, that really did so much for me. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so it's Vacchiano. Interesting, um, yeah. Uh, Chris, you know Chris very well, I'm sure. Yeah, and played with one him of so my much. favorite like, players. How, how, and, and it must have been, a, I always th felt like he, he was a guest on our Bone to Pick series uh, quite a while ago and also did a hip bone you list, and, and I thought his teaching was just tremendous. I wish, uh, yeah. I, wish I could take some lessons from him. Uh, he, even as a trombone player, I just felt like, wow, there's just so much to le be learned from this. Yeah, and, it'd uh, be worth down the trip down to Maryland. Yeah, yeah, uh, for sure. He, Chris is, uh, I mean, Probably the, the, the most humble and nice, uh, despite his uh, physique, uh, which, which, which uh, you know, he's such a strong guy, but such a soft character. Uh, uh, he's, I can't say enough nice things about him. Uh, musically, he was a real big proponent of um, just being prepared, mm -hmm. like musically prepared like physically prepared with your trumpet playing. Uh, all of his books uh, talk a lot about different kinds of articulation, had, be, being prepared to play high, low, fast, loud, <clears throat> and being really uh, versatile. I think simply because he really made a career out of being so versatile. Yeah, you know, I, I, would, I would see you know, we'd, in our lessons, I'd be like, so where are you coming from? Where are you going? He says, well, I'm coming from two Brandenburgs. Like, he used to play Orpheus and St. Luke's Kitty concerts, and they used to do Brandenburg on it. And they, you know, they do those, you know, two or three shows a day for like a week at Carnegie or wherever it was. And, you know, he would play the Brandenburg twice in a day and then <laughs> teach me and then go play a couple sessions and then maybe a show that night or show, either a show or or performance uh, somewhere else or subbing at the Philharmonic. So he would, he could do all these different things. Forget musical styles, just being able to like play it. Right. Yeah. It insane. I don't, I don't, I don't know anybody else that can do that. Um, so just on, on a minute level, just being able to play, uh, to develop your arsenal uh, just with uh, sound and articulation uh, and the importance of just being on when you need to be there. Uh, and actually, some of the, the, the greatest lessons I learned from him was uh, I used to babysit one of his kids. And it's funny to me now because Liana's uh, uh, older than my kids, and my boys are 20, 20 now. Uh, so it's, <clears throat> it's, it's strange to... to to, uh, to think that it was so long ago, but she, she was a baby, 
and I used to babysit, so I'd have her in a stroller while Chris was like, can you just follow me around? So I'd, I'd be like here, like, or in, uh, at, 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 uh, on, on 54th Street, uh, and Chris would be doing a commercial jingle, and I'd just be trying to keep Liana entertained, <laughs> and uh, he'd play it, but I'd, I'd listen, and uh, it was like really hard stuff to play, and yeah. he would just, you know, E major up high on the trumpet, which is not easy, and he was just, he wouldn't miss. And, you know, uh, so, it, yeah, just being prepared, being ready to, to play what's asked of you was uh, hearing him play and then then uh, talking about it was, was really invaluable. And how about Wenton? Did, is there any, could you, I, I'm sure you learned a lot from Wenton, uh, especially against having an opportunity to study with him so young, but. Uh, like, in a way, it, you know, it's funny, in a way, being in the same room as somebody like, uh, Winton, um, or, you know, I, I put a lot of people in this category. Uh, you you kind of, in a way, they're lousy teachers. Sorry. <laughs> but uh, in that, you know, nobody plays like Winton. Like, zero people play sure, like Winton. Yeah. And uh, so the, the, the extent that Winton can do, you know, I, I, I'll give you an example. I'm a, like, He'd play, I don't know, like the Tomasi or or, or play uh, Molto Perpetuo. He had the record with Eastman Wind Ensemble. He played Paganini's Molto Perpetuo in, in one breath. You know, he'd circular mm-hmm. breathe. And he'd play that for me, like in his living room. I'd be like, well, how do you do that? You know, or how do you do these really hard things? And he, for him, all he needed to focus on was, uh, it's why I try to just relax and stay focused and really just work on taking a deep breath. I'm like... <laughs> That, that's it. It's got to be that, more than that. You know, it's like, uh, you know, what he's not saying is that he, you know, he practiced. Uh, you know, he he did his work when he was, you know, when he was a kid, and it stuck. And he's what he's not saying is that he's one of, if not the best trumpet player uh, in history. Sure. So, in in that sense, in a verbal sense, he's a horrible teacher. Uh, <laughs> In every other sense, it was, uh, you know, you know, play one note and you can hear, you know, that that's what you want to be. Um, but I learned from him uh, beyond just what you can derive from listening to him um, and hearing him speak about anything, really. Um, you know, if, if I'd go to his apartment, I'd, I'm getting ready the Hinemuth Sonata, for example, and I have it up on the on the on the on the stand he'd be like all right well let's talk about uh what hindemith may have been influenced by he's like do you know what was going on politically in the time of i'd be like no i know the first note is open that's that's about it like you know so we talk about art uh, and talk about uh and then also talk about uh just the thematic uh progressions and the, the scheme he talked a lot about you know we would just open the back of the arbin's book where there's the, the uh, all those little two-line phrases uh, or you know uh, little songs, and he'd be like, "All right, I remember it's the first one." He says, "Let's play this," and I'd play it. And he goes, "Well, you're not really playing it because check it out. This is a statement. Is this a statement? Is this a question? Is it going someplace? Where is it going?" So we kind of break things down very almost seemingly mathematically hmm. uh, just to make sense of the music and mm-hmm. like basic phrasing things. So uh, from him, I, I just learned uh, you know, how to look at, you know, putting trumpet aside, how to, how to you know, really be a, a musician or, or, you know, an artist uh, as a whole. Mm-hmm. The, mm-hmm. Again, it's, it's, it's hard to talk about because it it's so much, but um, yeah, just really inspiring. And then Pandolfi, uh, tone. You know, every, there's so many great tones, even, you know, Gecker's tone, Vacchiano's tone, Winton's tone, and Pandolfi tone. Pandolfi's tone are, are four equally beautiful, amazing, different things. It's like, you know, saying, which of your children do you love more? Um, <laughs> Uh, you know which one you are. <laughs> uh, uh, but Pandolfi taught me physically how to make a good tone. Hmm. 
and uh, it wasn't easy. I babysat for him too. I babysat for Bobby, his son. Uh, and when I b accumulated enough babysitting hours, uh, that tra that you know I'd, I'd get a lesson. Uh, and he lived right across the street from the Met uh, on Columbus Avenue. And uh, we'd go in, and have these lessons there, or in the, in the in the, back in the Met. And we were just literally just trying. He'd scream, just just trying to get a sound that is tenable, uh, one that, that is reliable and, and something that you can, uh, and so th that was, without that, I, I, you know, he really turned my, he really turned my playing around 180 degrees mm. and, uh, and I think without him, not I think, without him I, I definitely wouldn't have a job or hmm. be probably in music today, definitely. Wow. Well, you certainly had great, uh, great direction from all these things. It's, it's cool. That yeah, they, they, got you got no, no you got, excuse. You got, uh, you got something, you know, unique from each person. That's very, uh, very cool. And uh, years ago, I used to live on uh, 71st and I Columbus. remember. And, uh, and I used to walk down the street, and it took me a while to realize that it was Jim, but it was like, you're absolutely right. I was like, man, that guy's a gorgeous sound. Who is that? Yeah, you yeah. Know? And especially, like, in the summer, the windows would be open, and you could uh, hear him. It it's really like that great. scene in The Godfather where, <laughs> like, the, the, they're going down the street, and you hear that right before he gets shot, um, you hear a trumpet player quack, cracks his scales. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, let's jump ahead and talk about the Met, because I, I know a lot of our viewers would uh, be interested in, in many of the, the, the facets of, uh, of what that has become for you. Um, you won the job in 2001, so you've been there now a long time, really. Um, can you talk about what that was like, the audition process, and, and just your memories of, uh, of landing the job in that initial <laughs> first, first year or two being there, what that, what that was like for you? Um, the audition process was like any other one now. Uh, I mean, prelims, semis, finals, and uh, I do remember that they were all on different days. Um, just because I, uh, for one reason or another, um, so or maybe the prelims and summits were, no, there were three different days. So I, I remember, and at that point in 2001, I had been taking auditions for about, f uh, five years and getting close in some, close enough to keep me going. Mm -hmm. But, uh, like we were saying, uh, before the interview, you asked me how old my boys were. Uh, so we, we had... My wife and I have kids at a pretty young age, um, so and we're living in Manhattan. So, at the she was working, fortunately, kind of providing while I was freelancing, uh, but and taking auditions, and uh, I got pretty close to to some jobs, not in New York, but uh, by the time the Met came around, I had already quit taking auditions. Wow. Uh, I hung it up at one point because uh, when Chris moved, I was doing a lot of freelance work thanks to Chris Gecker in New York, uh, and then he he left for Maryland uh, he, to take a teaching position there, and <laughs> like with with a lot of, about seventy percent of anywhere I hadn't made inroads making the finals in an orchestra, and they were calling me for the sub list. Everything else pretty much went away. Uh, oh, wow. Uh, after Chris left. Okay. Um, so, and th that combined with our rent, combined with the fact that, you know, we had to feed babies. Uh, and I was like, and so, and then going to take auditions, it was like, how many of these am I going to do? Like, I got to put bread on the table. So, at one point, I quit uh, and realized that. Uh, I had nothing else to fall back on because, like I said before, I'd been at Juilliard since I was like 15 years old. So the only thing, other thing I knew this is going to get depressing. Uh, <laughs> the only thing, uh, the only other thing I knew how to do was cook, and I didn't really. I mean, I like to cook, uh, so I put up signs on the street corners. I was living at 90th and Amsterdam at the time. So I remember, like, right under, like, the Dan Smith will teach you guitar, like, posters. <laughs> I put, like, you know, West Side Chef. And I had a beeper. Uh, and uh, I changed. I mean, everybody had a beeper, right? It was, like, right, it, was, right. uh, it was the 90s. And uh, I changed the outgoing voicemail on my, on my beeper uh, from 
hey, David Krause, trumpet player, I'll work for anything to, this is West Side Chef. Uh, and nobody called. The only call I ever got was Charlie Baker. You know Charlie. Yeah, sure, uh, sure. He, he, at the time, he was personnel manager of the New Jersey Symphony in addition to principal trombone. And uh, he goes, I was, you know, I was trying to reach you, uh, but I just kept getting the chef. Uh, uh, so I missed out on work on that. So that was short-lived. I didn't get one cooking gig. Um, so that was short. So then I was like, all right, I got like a four on my SAT. So I didn't really have many, many different options. Uh, so I figured I might as well stick with this. And thanks to my wife saying, you, you know, you, you should probably just do this, mm -hmm. uh, a little more. Uh, and then, then, then I got, I got the Met. Um, but I remember those, those days. So by the time I had got to the Met and my wife was pregnant, with uh, our third at the time, so it was it was dire. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> so uh, got the prelims. I remember like saying, "All right, just be cool." So I, I ate the same thing. I wore the same clothes. I kept the same underwear on, uh, same socks. I did everything the same. I ate the same thing in the morning. I had like a banana and a glass of water or something else. Like, like I did exactly, like I'm not like an OCD kind of guy, but like that day, I, that week I was. And yeah, and uh, th then I won the job. Um, funny thing about it was that I won the job and Pandolfi and a couple others took me out. I won the job. It was, we were done like at, in the afternoon, like at one or something like that. I remember it was daylight out. <clears throat> and uh, they took me to Il Violino, you know, that, that sure. place yeah. right across the street from Lincoln Center, and uh, w went to the bar, and uh, Pandolfi was, was pretty proud because I was a student, you yeah. know, and now I'm playing with him. And some of the other guys from the section was there, and we saddled up to the bar, and I said, I'll have a, a beer or whatever, and the guy carded me. <laughs> uh, so that was funny. Pandolfi <laughs> fell off the thing. But, so I had a, a couple beers. Uh, I think I drank a little too much, and uh, I called my wife, and she was working in New Jersey, uh, teaching violin in New Jersey, and she had the car, and she had to make it down to 54th Street to teach there because she was making money. And uh, I called her in New Jersey. I said, I want She said, that's great, but you have to take the car from me. So she came down Columbus <laughs> Avenue, and I came out of this bar, <laughs> and she goes, I, I love you. This is great. We'll talk about it later. I have to get to work. So she left me the car, and... Uh, like I didn't know what to do. Uh, so I just kept, uh, I took the car and kept circling around Columbus Circle. Because uh, I, I didn't want to drive drunk. Uh, I guess I was <laughs> driving, I wasn't driving drunk. But anyway, so I kept driving around Columbus Circle, uh, just thinking to myself, I just want a job. Like I'm, uh, so yeah. Yeah. Not the not the most driver friendly. Uh, uh, well, it was a circle. <laughs> I didn't have to do anything. I could just I stay in the inner lane around Columbus Circle. Uh, so yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, we I certainly I'm sure you were coming through through Juilliard and, and knowing all those guys. But uh, it is now you're like a significant part of it yourself. But the lineage of of great trumpet players who've who've gone through. Uh, through the Met, but in particular in your chair with Mel Broyles and, and Mark Gould, and uh, what was that like for you, uh, like taking over that uh, a, a position like that, which is clearly some big shoes to fill, you know? Yeah, I, I don't really think of it like that, mm -hmm. um, only because uh, the the Met is it, it's different somehow. I think than uh, like when you're at the Philharmonic, like I, I couldn't imagine what it would what it must have been like for Chris. Martin to like sit or sit like at the Chicago Symphony, like, you know, be the guy after Bud or something. Right. Like that's kind of a, Mel was like a real powerhouse in his day and, and really uh, he, he lived the job. He, he was a character. Uh, but so by the time he, by the time he was, by the time he retired, he didn't really retire. He, he like, he, he it was he couldn't he couldn't be there anymore. Like he had, we do this opera, Rosen Cavalier, and at the end of it, uh, it the end of it, there's the trumpet soars to a uh, uh, high concert C sharp. A at the end of 
and it, you crescendo on it. It starts very soft, so it's really easy to get like a little lightheaded mm -hmm. uh, during it. And Mel, towards the end, he played it, and uh, he had a stroke during it mm. and collapsed. And that happens in the, late in the, after the trio in the third act, and there's still a good four minutes, five minutes till the end of the show. He finished the show, right? Like, uh, so he was, uh, he, he I never wanted to leave there. Uh, so uh, a lot now it's like when I play an opera, it's like, well, you know, jokingly, that's not how Mel used to do it, you know. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so he, he was a character um, and, and a great, great trumpet player in his own right. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so the, uh, the opera house is just, it's different. Like the, the orchestra isn't the show. Mm, right, the, of course. The show is the show. So uh, it's actually amazing uh, that, you know, these, and I've been there for long enough to see a lot of really amazing players. Uh, retire or move to different orchestras and like while they're there you're like how are we going to function without so and so and then you come in the next september and there's somebody else and you're like wow that person's really good too you know yeah. like i think we'll be just fine <laughs> so uh um it's somehow it's 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 a little different so uh i don't really consider it i i'm honored uh, to have the position, mm -hmm. really, mm -hmm. I, I still pinch myself. Uh, but it's in, in terms of the the lineage thing, I, I uh, it's just different. Yeah, yeah. cool. Um, this is probably an, uh, a difficult question, but uh, are there two or three highlights that you look back in the seventeen years? I'm sure that's asking you to pare down a lot of leave out a lot of yeah. stuff. But uh, are there a couple things that jump out at you uh, as your favorite moments being a being a part of the uh, orchestra, um, one that one that does is uh, I was in the Met before I was in the Met. I was in the children's chorus. Uh, my mom used to drive me in, uh, and there was the, it was the same chorus that did the Met and the City Opera. Mm. So <clears throat> when I was like twelve or thirteen, uh, maybe even yeah, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, maybe I can't even remember. Uh, I performed in, in, in Tosca, La Boheme, all the different ones that had kids' courses in it, and it was a great experience. Uh, and then my boys both also did it. Um, so, uh, and the one, uh, at the time, the one production was the same, uh, Boheme was the same and Tosca was the same. They replaced it now twice since I've been in the Met. Uh, but it was the same production uh, that I was in, and I saw my kids in, oh, and cool. it was Pavarotti. They brought Pavarotti back. Uh, it was like his last Tosca. So Pavarotti was on the stage. That was pretty cool. I was relatively new to the orchestra. Levine was conducting. My kids were wearing like the same costumes <laughs> that, that I was, and my, my parents were in the house. Uh, so that was like a really wow, uh, kind of awesome, cool man. full circle <laughs> uh, thing. That was that was really special. Um, and then at the Opera House, there's <clears throat> there's so many so many special musical moments. Sometimes you have a really inspiring conductor and a great production, but you're but maybe you're playing a piece of music that is like less inspiring, mm -hmm. or maybe you have you know this unbelievable cast. And you're playing great music, and the conductor's like not so inspiring. Uh, but more, I mean, a lot of times there's a great conductor, a great cast, and a really cool production. Uh, uh, so there's a lot of potential there to be inspired, and and really and just be, you know, as a playing or not playing, you know, being in the opera house uh, night after night for that amount of hours, uh, you're bound to be entertained, <laughs> you know. So uh, a lot of people ask me, do you even like opera? <laughs> like I got this job and now like you're like this opera guy. Uh, and, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, sure. But like, uh, am I an opera aficionado? No. Uh, but I, I know what I like. So. Um, 
there's operas I like to play. And there's operas I like to listen to. Mm -hmm. um, no trumpet player has ever said, oh, you know, I just played a Mozart opera that, you know, it's like it was such a great <laughs> experience. Uh, but actually the, the first time, not playing it, but just being involved in the first time I did a Mozart opera with, with Levine. It's crazy. Mm. Like, really? You get to play really loud and really soft? And you, the, the, it, it, it became somewhat less of a museum piece and more of like a, a real flesh and blood, just uh, amazing thing to be a part of. That, that was amazing, doing a ring cycle. Uh, or, uh, and then stuff that you play a lot more, like uh, any of the Strauss operas. We just finished a run of Parsifal uh, with our new music director that was that was pretty great hmm. so uh there's a lot of a lot of great music making and yeah. and theater this morning i just came we had a dress rehearsal a new mozart opera not new mozart opera new mozart production of of uh cosi fontuti and it takes place uh they have it take place in like coney island like in the 50s oh wow and they had uh literally just this morning they have like real circus people there so you're playing the overture, and there's somebody swallowing a sword, and there's uh, uh, there's fire. It's, it's, uh, at the opera house, like if you're if you're not that into the music, you can listen to the you can watch the singers. If you're not that into what the, you can watch the orchestra, or if you know at the very bottom of it, you know maybe there'll be somebody swallowing a sword on stage that could be entertaining. But uh, yeah, it's, it's a great place to work. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for sharing all that. That's very cool. Um, you know, you, throughout your career, you've also performed with a number of world-class orchestras, including New York Philharmonic and Chicago Symphony, Boston Symphony, uh, uh, also Orchestra of St. Luke's, New Jersey Symphony, etc. Um, you're the perfect guy to, to field this question and, and give us your perspective. How, when you... Uh, you know, there's obviously some obvious differences, but maybe just uh, take a second to compare what it's like to play uh, in a symphony orchestra as opposed to playing uh, in the opera orchestra. Um, well, the repertoire, you know, the, the forces are the same. Uh, pragmatically speaking, from a trumpet point of view, it's just when the music is spaced out uh, so long. I got a text from Chris... Martin, they just did the first act of De Valkyrie hmm. at the Philharmonic just a couple of weeks ago, or maybe a week ago. And I got a text from him that said, uh, just finished the first act of Valkyrie. He said, how do you do this? <laughs> and he wasn't referring to how hard it is to play. He was referring to how awkward it is to sit there, first act of Valkyrie, sit for 40 minutes. Hmm. And then you come in on this solo when he's in the stage production he pulls a sword out of a tree and you play this big theme and it's got to be pristine but you got to sit there for 40 minutes literally with nothing to do so he was more you know saying you know <laughs> this is challenging right. uh, uh, so I think the difference is uh, just the just the hours mm. you know a, 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 sh a typical night for us is an hours uh, like three hours 20 minutes something like that, an opera, like a standard Puccini opera is about, you know, three hours. Some of the, you know, Parsifal was just five and a half. You get a drum was six. You know, the, one of the shortest ones, tonight we're doing Electra. Electra's short. That's only uh, an hour and, hour 45, mm. something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. um, so even our, our shortest ones are, are pretty long in terms of just sitting down. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I've gotten really accustomed to it after having, you know, raising four children, uh, just the, just being able to sit down and like just stare is <laughs> now actually a great pleasure of mine. Uh, and just like not do anything, like just counting rests. That's, yeah. that's, I'm totally cool with it now. It used to drive me nuts. Uh, now just like staring blankly, it seems to be one of my fortes. Um, so uh, that's a big difference. Okay. And just the, the pacing of it. You know, playing a Mahler symphony uh, or Dvorak, Mozart, whatever, you know, if it's 40 minutes, uh, or it, it just your, your music, it's just going to be more condensed, a lot, a lot mm. less downtime. Mm -hmm. um, 
and uh, you know there's there's more subtle things too like the fact that um, in the pit the met is a huge pit so uh, but we're more kind of side to side rather than front to back so just uh, being able to play ahead if we're uh, and listen for the singers it's uh, but any hall that you play in has its own individual characteristics mm -hmm. but uh, mm -hmm. I'd, I'd say the biggest difference is just the time spread mm -hmm. uh, of it and the times that I do get to play uh, in a symphonic orchestra uh, or when we do our we have a series at Carnegie Hall where we do symphonic works at the end of the season uh, and then it's like you know we're done it's like 9:45. <laughs> like what do we do now uh, so that that's it's it's a little different yeah yeah do you guys, uh, when you do have those long chunks of time, as you're counting rest, you start talking about. Do you guys divvy that up between the uh, section, or every every man for himself? Yeah, well, it depends on the section. Uh, <laughs> in our section, uh, I think we're all pretty. The cues. The the good thing about Hopper also, the the cues is like you don't have to count everything. You know, it'll be like. 85 bars, 144 bars, and then like at the end of that, it'd be like a uh, cannon explosion, you know, uh, <laughs> written in the part. It'd be like, all right, that's a pretty obvious cue, you know. Uh, so it's, and I have a fantastic section at, at yeah. the Met. Uh, Jim Ross, Pete Bond, and Ray Riccomini, uh, th these guys, uh, they'll, they wouldn't, they wouldn't let me right. come in wrong. Oh, that's uh, great. So yeah, they're great. That's great. Hey, did the cannon explode yet? Yeah, right. Yeah, I, I think right. it did. I can't right. remember. You know. <laughs> um, who are your, and I know you mentioned Levine. I'm sure he's going to be in your list. Who, who are your most inspiring conductors uh, that you've get, gotten to work with? Um, well, yeah. I mean, the guy who hired me and the guy who hasn't fired me yet are my two. <laughs> those are the two guys. So that would be James Levine and Yannick uh, Neza Sagan, who's our uh, incoming music director. He starts officially next year. Okay. Um, so they're at the top of the list for <laughs> sure. Uh, and, uh, I've, I've worked with a lot of really great conductors, uh, off the top of my head, uh, Gergiev, uh, Valery Gergiev is, is uh, he's fantastic. Mm. You know, we do th those Carnegie concerts, uh, at the end of the season, we do, it's not like we do a cycle of four concerts throughout the week. We do one. So I've played... So, like the staples of our repertoire, I've played once in my life. Hmm. Uh, so like I did Mahler 5 with Levine at Carnegie once uh, on a Sunday. We do it one time. Or I did pictures in an exhibition once with Gergiev. I did Rite of Spring once with Gergiev. Uh, we did, you know, Mahler 7, Mahler 1, Mahler, you know, the big repertoire pieces with these great conductors, uh, but you do it once. So, and that's, so that's, it's a pressure but uh, doing pictures on exhibition, if I had to pick one guy to do it with, you know, he's a pretty inspiring guy. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, Muti, is, Muti has come to, uh, I worked with him at the Met and uh, for a week in Chicago. He's, he's, he's really great. Mm -hmm. uh, Berenbaum, I mean, it, it, there's so many great conductors. It's uh, Louisi, um, a, lo a lot of really great conductors. And I find more often than not, um, the, the really truly inspiring great conductors are really you know good guys hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, with maybe one or two exceptions but uh, um, yeah I'm lucky to, to have very lucky and and it's great being in New York because if uh, and I tell my students this all the time uh, you know to, to take advantage of going to Carnegie uh, and hearing and seeing the great conductors and great orchestras in, in New York, it's like any given week you have these great. So it's it's great that they come and they they work with us at the Met, but uh, they're also coming through town, and it's uh, no excuse not to hear the absolute best right. in the world every night. It's yeah. it's, it's pretty uh, it's pretty great. Yeah, yeah. There's no question. It's a great great place to be in that regard. Um, let's talk a little bit about the future of the Met. Um, it's been interesting, uh, just as a as a as a consumer and as a uh, fan of, uh, of live music in general, but certainly uh, all facets of music. But um, the Met seems to have uh, figured out new ways of marketing itself and putting their product out there. And, you know, I know there's um, 
various things that go on in terms of general managers and people in that camp. And the, but what do you, how do you see the uh, how do you see the future unfolding for the for the Met? Obviously, it's one of the hopefully the, the, well. <laughs> uh, it's, you know, clearly a pre, the premier opera uh, orchestra in the world, but but uh, or production company, however you want to describe it. But uh, but it seems like they're constantly still trying to figure out new ways to to bring opera to the general public. One of the big steps forward was uh, when I first joined the Met. It was just every Saturday they'd be on the radio, and they've that's been forever, mm -hmm. and that's kind of a, a, a historic deal that they've had and it's and it's been it was great uh but then like my once our new general manager peter gill came in <clears throat> um there's there was a media agreement that um we do live and hd uh movies streamed to the world so that's been really cool you know and and during the overtures they'll have the cameras on the pit so i'll get texts and emails saying, you know, I saw you, uh, and uh, it seems like, and I know a lot of people that would rather, well, they're out of town, so it's it's a great way for 20 bucks or whatever, how much movie ticket is, you go and see him, uh, the Met at the movie, and it's, it's mm -hmm. pretty, pretty amazing. I've never been to one, because I'm always working, but I, yeah. I'd like to. My mom, my parents once went, and I was interviewed, they do these interview things, and uh, um, they interviewed me as part of, I don't know why they did, but uh, they did. So my parents would usually come to the Met Opera House, uh, but they went to the movie theater just to see, you know. So the uh, the interview was like like 45 seconds. I mean, it, it, <laughs> max, it was a minute and a half, uh -huh. max. And I got, I got a, a phone call from my mom saying, Dad, you're so handsome, <laughs> and uh, you know I can't believe how long the interview was—a solid, a solid 20 minutes. And uh, I was like, "Mom, it was like maybe a minute and a half, maybe." Uh, she goes, "David, I, I swear, it was 20 minutes long. I was looking at my watch, and you were just so handsome." And all that. <laughs> I was like, "All right." Uh, so th she's those a are proud mom. She's a proud mother. Her. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So, uh, so those are really great. I, I think it's such a big house with so many different unions, so complicated. I purposely am, am never on the musicians committee because uh, I know I would fold in a heartbeat. Mm -hmm. So whatever, yeah, yeah, okay, good. I see. You know, uh, so that's not good for 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 right. committees to do. So I'm fortunate that that uh, we have a strong one. And uh, the thing that strikes me the most is. Uh, at least in the opera house, when you have these new, uh, these new, either a new opera or a new production or something, and and like it's it's exciting. Like I was saying this uh, that this morning we had, uh, you know, fire eaters on stage. Like that that's great. But uh, what really strikes me is when there's some bel canto opera. We did Semiramide. Uh, of which you know you're playing umpas the whole time for four hours, and I'm just bored to tears uh, playing. But there's great singers on the stage, and the sets are like really stagnant. It's mm. not, and the people love it. Mm. I don't know anything about producing opera, but uh, I think the if, with great artistry, um, I think the other stuff is great, and it's great to to bring new people in. Uh, but Great singing, great playing, kind mm -hmm. of takes care of itself. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's, there's, we get the best singers in the world every night. Mm -hmm. The best singers in the world every night. Yeah. Uh, it's like you know, where else in the world? It's like you know, Vegas for food, right? It's like <laughs> every, every like hot shot thing like opens up in Vegas. Like this is every night there. You have literally the best. Uh, so I, I find it difficult to believe in humanity that that someday something like the Met wouldn't exist so I'm I'm, I'm hopeful for the future yeah yeah well there's certainly no uh, no substitute for the best artistry especially when your product is uh, opera and, and music in that regard so that's, that's great um, just a couple more questions David once again thanks for all your time and uh, insight and great stories today sure this has been a, uh, just a, a joy um, you talked a little bit at the beginning about the the audition process for yourself and the fact that 
you were just sounds like you were tenacious. Your wife was very supportive. Uh, you know, great stuff. Um, I know I talk to young people, even though I'm in the commercial world of, of brass playing, but it's always been fascinating to me that that process. Do you have any, you know, without going into a whole thing for, about it, but do you have a couple of key points? I know I read something where you just talked about how important preparation is, and you talked about that with with, uh, with Chris Gecker, but what's been your experience in terms of managing, maybe managing nerves, dealing with stuff, What all the th aspects that you have to deal with to have a successful audition? Well, uh, well, nerves, first of all, uh, and, you know, I go back to uh, Winton. I used to ask him, do you get nervous? And Winton's like, w Winton would say, like, well, it's good to feel some butterflies. Uh, so, yeah, sure, I get nervous. I'm like, I don't think you understand what nervous <laughs> ear is. You know, nervous is like not being able to breathe and, and like having no notes come out of your, your horn. That's nervous. <laughs> and uh, I think I don't think he's ever really experienced that. Um, uh, so nerves, and, and I, I tell my students a lot, it, you treat nerves like, uh, you know, if I were to, I could walk out this door and not be nervous, but if you told me that there was a bear on the other side of that door, <laughs> I would be nervous to go through that door. Right. So in uh, the only way, one of the ways I realized not to make myself nervous in performance is realize you're nervous for a reason. There's a bear behind the door. All right, what's your bear? I might not hit the high C. I can't tongue fast enough. I can't do, I can't make it through this or whatever. So, you know, in your practice room, uh, it really wasn't until I kind of took care of those aspects and realized that it wasn't the, the process that was making me nervous. It was the, it was, it was that. It, so if you systematically can try to eliminate those factors, you'll be less nervous. And that, you know, like Winton, like, his biggest fear, his bear, was like maybe he wouldn't play as totally awesome as he possibly could, <laughs> right? Uh, or, you know, uh, whereas my, my fear would be like maybe i just collapse. So, well, work on the things that, that. so that did a lot for my, for my uh, getting nervous mm -hmm. in auditions and, and performances and, and uh, so I, I think if there's something to be nervous about, then you know you're gonna get nervous, uh, and nerves can nerves can happen all the time. I mean, I, I get nervous for uh, speaking. Uh, I, I, I'm I'm okay, I'm fine public speaking, but if if I had to like speak at like you know my brother's wedding a long time ago, I remember like getting like really uptight for that. Uh, you, you know, so nerves nerves can happen. Uh, Anytime, but again, that's it's the fear of the unknown. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. With auditions, um, you want you want to limit your unknowns. You know, you want to be as 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 prepared as possible. Today, after I leave you, I told you I have to go up to Manhattan School, and I'll do a trumpet class there. And uh, I wrote I wrote an email to all the trumpet students. I said the, the theme of the class is going to be uh, the title of the class is going to getting to be an apple or an orange and you know i think they were kind of scratching their heads like what the hell does that mean and i explained it means that you know getting to the finals or getting to any position in life really where you're judged uh solely on what you have to offer they're picking between apples and oranges so by the time you get to a finals of an audition of a symphonic orchestra uh or an opera orchestra or whatever the they're going to be picking between you know, five or ten or two or three qualified candidates all could do the job. They all jump through the hoops of the prelims and the semis. They prove that they can play high, loud, you know, all these things. And then you're left with apples and oranges. And I think for too many people, myself included, it took way too long for me to figure this out, that, uh, you know, you wouldn't get through an audition. You wouldn't get past the prelims. Be like, and you'd question, you know, that inner depths of your soul like maybe i'm not cut out for this maybe my sound isn't right my style and you'd work on that stuff You're like no like it was out of tune or mm -hmm. no it mm -hmm. was out of time so the, the class that i'll do at six o'clock tonight uh is just working on those things taking the standard you know petrushka Mahler five leonore pines rome all these things and and going through and i'll have the students play them and say you know, you might have, you might be the 
greatest artist in the world, but you're not going to get you're not going to get heard unless you satisfy these requirements. And I think so much of that wasn't addressed by my own playing uh, earlier on. You know, I think I was the same musician when I wasn't uh, wasn't winning uh, jobs or placing uh, than I, than than I am now. Just uh, I took I figured out that you you have to satisfy those things. And then if you're lucky enough to to get, you know, in the in the finals enough times, you know, you'll be, they'll they'll pluck you, <laughs> you know, you, you'll be the, the 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 fruit that they want that particular day. But I think the key is, uh, and it's something I try to instill in a lot of my students is that you know your first job is to play in tune, play in time, mm -hmm. and not be a total yeah. moron phrasing wise. And then, you know, then you can get into the specifics like how you feel, yeah. or like what the music is saying. But unless you know those those first couple rounds is like just seeing who can play. Yeah. So that I think that's like a, a something that's really overlooked and something that can really save you from years of depression and like self loathing of you know saying you know I'm not <laughs> I'm not worthy of this or I you know I uh, or I suck you know it's 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 not that you might very well suck but uh, but <laughs> in the meantime you have to figure out what you did, what you presented. And yeah. if, it, if it's simply not, you could be, it could be as simple as that was out of tune. You got to fix it. Yeah. And I, I didn't learn that until later in life. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Uh, that's a great insight. I mean, let's face it. I mean, like, like you just said, I mean, if it's got to be in tune and in time, those are the first two things. And, you know, right. hopefully with a good sound. And if you have those three elements, you're, you're right. going to be in the ballpark. You right. Know, then, like you're saying, they're picking apples and oranges. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, David, last question. I always kind of end this, with this. We have a lot of young folks who uh, tune into these interviews, and uh, we appreciate you watching. And uh, it's not uh, not hard to do when you get a, an artist of this stature and get to hear their insights. It's really it's great for for all of us to uh, to have an opportunity to sit down with somebody like David Krause. David, um, you have two uh, soon to be twenty one year olds, so you you probably are well seasoned in the, in how to uh, approach this. But what advice do you have? Uh, for young, especially young musicians, I know one of your, your sons is a, is a cellist. Um, it's such a changing landscape in terms of the music business. Certainly, in the in all, I think in all areas, it's certainly yeah. more competitive now more than ever. Um, if you had to pare it down to maybe one piece of advice, what would you say to uh, young folks coming up? Uh, hmm. In addition to playing in tune and in time, yeah. <laughs> I, I know in, in my own experience with my own. Boys, one like I said, is in film school, and the others at at, at Juilliard, uh, pursuing music. Uh, it's not like it's not like becoming a doctor or a lawyer. I would imagine, and I'm not I'm not saying that's any easier, but uh, to a certain extent, if you pursue a pr profession, if you get a degree and fulfill these things, and if you're lucky enough to get a job, all all of those all of the hard work that you've done will remain mm -hmm. you know like it's it's hard being uh, a musician because like you, you practice since you're a, uh, a fetus and then all of a sudden you want all that stuff to uh, to stand for something but at the end of the day it doesn't because you're behind a screen auditioning or maybe you know uh, you uh, if you're being a freelancer maybe you know you, you you don't get called from a certain contractor There's so many variables like all the hard work that you've put in uh, maybe at that time won't line up. You won't get an audition or you won't get a call or, uh, you know, I've, I've got two daughters too. One of them is at, uh, uh, they both play instruments, but the other's at LaGuardia uh, and she does musical theater. And, mm. and, you know, it's it's heart crushing to see when your daughter doesn't get picked for a, a show or something like that, uh, you know, and her, her life ends. Y yeah. You know, or, or and my life ended when I didn't audition, when I didn't advance for an audition. But the, I think that the, the the key is Chris Gecker gave me some really great advice uh, when I was in school and I was uh, really it was looking like I was just gonna I was gonna freelance in New York and I was lucky enough to do it for five or six years. Um, but before I started, I said, you know, how am I gonna how am I going to do this? Like, is it possible? And uh, and he said, you 
to be a freelance trumpet player in New York uh, or a successful musician in New York, you need two things. You need a, a good tone and you need not to be an asshole. <laughs> and, uh, and I laugh and, he, and, uh, and the, more, the older I get, the more I see that as being true because, uh, you know, if you have a tenure position in an orchestra, that's, that's different. You, you can afford to be one uh, <laughs> to an extent. Uh, but if you're, you know, if you freelance and your, your, your reputation uh, precedes you many times, uh, you, you know, there's only a handful of trumpet players that I know that have a really beautiful tone who are nice guys. Yeah. yeah. And those two things together. So uh, I would imagine that extends to many professions and at least in my own family from all my kids that uh, I, I encourage them to, you know, you're going to face hard times and face a lot of rejection if you're going into the arts uh, and it's all very subjective and it's not fair um, but and I faced my fair share but uh, had I quit mm -hmm. um, you know I, I, I'd, be, I'd be doing something else now and maybe not as as successful uh, in in whatever field it was but I think just just showing up and uh, and and being a nice guy, just be a nice guy and have a nice sound in whatever endeavor that you're trying to do, mm -hmm. uh, and just keep showing up. Um, I think that's 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 a pretty important thing uh, to keep in mind. Yeah, that's awesome. Great advice. I feel like a jerk giving yeah. advice. You know, yeah. it's like who am I? But yeah, <laughs> whatever. Well, that sounds like a great spot to uh, to wrap it up. <laughs> but uh, David, we thank you again for uh, uh, all your time today. And uh, for those of you who uh, come to New York, go hear the Metropolitan Opera and hear this uh, gentleman, uh, uh, one of the great trumpet players anywhere in the world. So, David, thank you so much. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate the time. Sure. And uh, we will see all of you next time on Bone to Pick. <laughs>